I guess I will start now. So welcome to our talk, uh, opening Adobe.com source code uh, that uh, Chris and I, my colleague, uh, we are we are going to to present you. So both uh, Chris Miller and I are Adobe.com developers, and we are both um, open source enthusiasts and uh, Slink enthusiasts. Uh, we are going to present you uh, uh, that uh, opening of Adobe.com sources in two parts. I will first start by explaining you, explaining you the reasoning uh, behind uh, that opening, and then Chris will uh, present you uh, the features themselves. So to start, uh, I like to use the projection of uh, software into evolution theory uh, that can be um, resumed by that, uh, that uh, software Darwinism expression. Uh, and this starts with uh, you as a young developer uh, developing your first AM uh, project. Uh, you will certainly do something that can be um, seen as a dodo, as a very endemic uh, customization. Uh, you don't know everything about uh, what is in the box already. You don't know everything about all the frameworks out in the wild. And you will have a nice idea about a new feature you will develop, but maybe others have that idea. Here, I would also like to, to make the differentiation between um, two kinds of customization. One is uh, a, a new development uh, you are doing, uh, and another would more be a configuration of an existing um, uh, framework piece or the product piece. Uh, and yeah, the, the problem at the beginning is that uh, you're not aware of everything that exists, and you might not be totally um, interrelated uh, with other developers. Uh, you might ask why it affects um, a company that <laughs> is selling Adobe uh, Experience Manager. Well, uh, we have had many, many uh, websites, and we have many websites uh, that uh, had different uh, business users and that had uh, different uh, requirements, development teams that ended up each one in their site uh, developing their own components and projects. Um, all of those projects ended up in our bag. When I say our bag, it's Chris and I team. And uh, we had to, to manage that. You can quickly guess that it's uh, quickly started to be a problem because the surface of the code to maintain and to um, uh, make efficient was bigger and bigger. We had many duplication. So basically, we, we fixed it by um, gathering what was in common. Uh, how do you do that? You do that by bubbling up uh, a customization, so the dodo we should be for. Uh, will bubble up to Dexter if it's used by another, at least another website, another user of Dexter, and then uh, it, it will come there. Well, it's not exactly that simple because um, the other website might have its word to say, and you need around that framework of code, you need um, open development principle I already talked about in ADAPT2, uh, to uh, discuss uh, and um, eventually uh, decide uh, what should come up, what should bubble up to Dexter, uh, what best fit for the requirements. Um, and uh, in the end, there is code actually that comes into Dexter and that is comes down back down to the consumers. And in general, what is what we observed, uh, is that the code within that process gets better. It's, it's uh, uh, simple, but uh, it's, it's worth being said right now. Um, especially that 
uh, now we've uh are quite successful uh, with that process all our websites now are much easier to maintain um and we are wondering at that point well we we could just um uh, bubble it up again right um <clears throat> so uh this is where we introduce uh, that adobe dx uh you can already check it out on github so in adobe organization the adobe dash dx uh, repository uh it has uh, we opened it i think eight months ago and worked on it uh, off and on uh, at certain moments in time uh, you can already use us uh, we have a special application within that repository uh which is which is called docs and its um goal it's to be um deployed on aem as a cloud service as is so basically you you look at the the roots of that application and you can deploy it to aem as a cloud service um basically all the dependencies of that application are all our artifacts and the goal of that documentation application is to document themselves. For now, we haven't had time, unfortunately, to enter the content of it. Uh, there is a wiki uh, uh, in the repository that is the, the for now the, the only documentation we have about it. At that point, browsing uh, through our website, you can wonder, well, uh, why should I use, this is yet another this is yet another uh, framework. Why should I use them? Um, and there are s several answers to that. So um, the first one is we are not competing uh, with all of them. Um, and uh, then we have to say that, I, I already said it before, but uh, the, the, the process itself of bubbling up some features and and then use use them down makes our code better. So it's a very very there is a reason that is very selfish in it. And then it's also important for us to open up uh, our choices. Uh, we we choose to use that and that. We choose to use it that way. And uh, we are. It's open for discussion. It's open for your criticism. And it, again, this is a very selfish uh, <laughs> goal of um, getting our code better. Because in the end, what we want is to have uh, the best basement we can for our websites. Of course, you can use <laughs> our stuff because uh, we shared what we thought uh, was going to be useful. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the code you will, uh, you will see that Chris is, is showing you uh, as is useful for at least uh, five or six of our websites. So it's very likely that it's a good candidate for your website as well. Uh, we are, um, for now, uh, based uh, on uh, those very simple uh, bricks. Uh, of course, AEM and Sling. Uh, core components is uh, on an arc, like uh, I think all of, other web of our websites. Uh, using core components as a basement for rendering uh, our components. Uh, and uh, for unit testing, we are um, uh, mostly using right now uh, WCMIO uh, mocks and Sling mocks uh, for, for this. So again, uh, please have a look at how we use them. Uh, maybe it will help you. Uh, I, some of the usages, I, I haven't found a lot of, of, of on, on, on GitHub. Uh, we would really love uh, that other um, consumers, uh, customers, uh, like we are, we are a specific customer, but we would really love that other customers uh, are doing the same as us, like sharing their choices, sharing their good ideas, and uh, so that we can share about them, and in the end, all end up with um, the, the, the best uh, uh, basement for our website. With that, I ended up to Chris, and I stop sharing if I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, can everybody see my screen? Hopefully. <clears throat> Nicola, you can confirm if you can see my screen. Unmute and confirm. 
<laughs> okay. Yes. I'm just going to go then. All right. So um, a, a couple of things that uh, to add to a, a couple of principles that, that Nicola shared. Um, when, when we started talking about requirements and, and sort of our core principles, these customizations that we talk about, we want them to be primitive and pluggable. And what that really means is, you know, core components, again, an, a wildly successful project. If you need a carousel, go go to the core component team. They've got you covered. So we want really primitive stuff, almost like Lego bl building blocks where you can build other things. And we want all of these customizations to be pluggable in the sense that you shouldn't have to write a lot of code to use these and you shouldn't have to copy code. So this, the idea is to keep uh, your project and our project very dry. Um, the other thing is discussing against other features and projects. When we make decisions about what we ship in DX and, and when you make decisions about what you want to contribute to us, um, you know, these things should be public discussions that, that happen. And we talk about, well, it does this particular contribution make more sense to maybe it goes to Sling or maybe it goes to WCMIO, maybe it goes to core components, or maybe it even goes to the product team uh, through daycare. Um, the other thing is when we when we started building DX, we, we said, well, what, what did we learn from our internal project called Dexter? What did we learn and how can we improve on that? And I'll actually give some specific examples. Um, and then as far as hard requirements, um, we absolutely, we, we had a very big uh, initiative to improve the performance of adobe.com, both from a server side perspective and from a lighthouse perspective, because as most know, lighthouse is becoming a more and more important uh, tool when talking about performance and when talking about like SEO page ranking. The other thing is it's got to be tested, of course. So we're looking at 80 plus percent of unit coverage. We have a UI test automation tool that we're going to be releasing soon. Um, and it's got to be battle tested by adobe.com. Again, lots of what you see today has already been shipping on adobe.com for the last two or three years. Um, this project has to, again, DX has to embody the spirit of open source. So all of the discussions happen on GitHub discussions. All of the, the issues are publicly made on GitHub issues. And then it has to be AEM as a cloud service. Uh, it has to be a first class citizen there. And this kind of goes back to the performance thing where, um, you know, AEM as a cloud service is you're running AEM on a container. So it's, it's a little bit resource constrained than what you would traditionally run. So this has to be really good and run really well on AEM as a cloud service. Um, and with that, uh, I want to talk in, and get into very specifics about what Adobe DX is today. So the first one to, we're going to talk about is Config Manager, which is a React-based extensible cloud config manager. So if you if you have ever um, if you have ever looked at some of the admin configuration screens, uh, you'll see a lot of JSP. You'll see a lot of jQuery. So we and, and you'll see a lot of copying and pasting. So what we wanted to do is create a config manager that A, we could plug any front end developer into and B, have it be pluggable. So you can add your own configurations without having to rewrite everything. And so this is the screen. And so you can just see here we have DX and settings, cloud configs, and we'll open up the Marketo configuration. Um, and this, all these key values will, will go away. But here you can see this is all built on React. And so, um, and I'll show that, but this is the UI. And so if we go and we look at Marketo config, go here. And so you can see we just import React. Um, we import some Spectrum stuff. So Spectrum is our internal design language, uh, which AEM as a cloud service is based off of. So it, the UI looks totally native. Um, we set up a default state. So again, this is just a plain old uh, JSON object. Um, we extend a React component. We set up our state. You know, if we're doing you know the default state or if we're editing something, um, because we're we're using React, we're really just managing state, and you have a lot less code that you have to a lot less UI glue code. You're not you know getting all these properties with jQuery and trying to get the changed events and all of that. It just it's again, super, super fast and, and quick to implement. And because we are using 
uh, React, it's very simple to do interesting things. So if we go back to our UI and I say, here is my client secret, you can see that the encrypted value changes. Um, and so in order, so you as a developer, when you want to integrate into this, so if I hit cancel and you want to create your own, you can see this pop, this, this uh, drop down. So you can actually, so if I say, oh, I want to create Adobe fonts. So the way this works is we'll just switch over to app. So all you have to do is make that one file. And then with a global property, you just register your app. So we have a, a key, we have a, a friendly name, and then we say what config we want. And then our config dialog actually takes care of the rest. So if you look at config, oops, config dialog, we actually use the operation import. So we use the sling post servlet. But because we want to work in native JSON, um, we use the operation import, and then we take care of all of that for you. So we, we send it up to the post servlet. It's all done for you. Um, you just have to create this one little file, and you have your own configurations. OK, so the next one. Uh, let's go see. CA data source. OK, so we had this challenge where we had a lot of drop downs that we wanted to populate. And, and you could say in a lot of ways, DX is a love letter to context aware configurations. But we wanted to populate drop downs and color fields and autocompletes with uh, context aware configurations. So that's exactly what we did. If we go to our dialog, you can actually see here we have, we'll just go look for one context aware. So we have this context aware data source. And you can supply a bucket name if you want, but we're using sling configs because that's the default. Um, and we're just saying, you know, we're using an attribute class of the CA config service. Um, and we're saying, oh, please populate this dropdown with the justification values. In our color field, if we go look for color field, you can see that we're, again, using the context aware data source. But instead, we're actually using, this would, of course, point to our local brand colors. And so this allows us to maintain separate brands on the same instance. Because you know, a company at the scale of, of Adobe, you know, we have many brands. We have Photoshop, we have Illustrator, we have Acrobat. And all of these have different brand colors. And so this allows us to be, start moving AEM towards this much more multi-tenant friendly uh, environment. So to see that in practice, we'll just switch over to this. And we have just a simple um, flex container, simple component. Um, and if we go down to, let's say, layout, here's that justification. And all of that is populated via the context of our data source. And if we go to, and we'll actually we'll talk about foreground, um, you can see swatches here. And so these are, this was actually a really interesting use case. And this gets into the context aware color field in that this color field is a coral color field and it wants to have this native value here. But of course we wanna store the key because if we decide to slightly change our, our brand red, you know, to be maybe a little bit more orange or a little bit more yellow or whatever, well, we should only have to make that change in one spot. So if you were to go look at our color field, doing good on time, uh, we'll go to color field. Um, so what we do is we still render this natively. So we use the coral color field, and this is backed by a, an actual sling model. So again, we're not using JSP here to create these dialog fields. Um, and then we store the actual value here. And so that way you get the same UI, but behind the scenes, it's using a context aware data source. Um, and then attribute worker. Another piece that we needed is um, we had this challenge, and I'll talk about attribute worker and something called author VH. We had this challenge where in editor.html, it really struggled handling viewport height. And that's a CSS property because the way the iframe would work in editor, it would just sort of infinitely scale. If you filed a daycare ticket about that, you, you know what I'm talking about. So if we inspect this screen and we go look for DX flex, and we'll just go look behind this. I don't need to see that. So here you can see data author VH mobile 60. So what that does is these attribute workers will actually populate CSS classes as needed and we'll populate data attributes as needed. And there's some Java classes that you can see. It's in our repo. Go check them out um, to see how this works. And so you have these attribute workers, and they populate the UI for you. And so that allows us to actually have uh, VH work. So you can see that 
author VH has interpreted uh, mobile height 60 uh, VH to a min height of 412 pixels. And that's part of the author watch service or author VH service. So we'll just go to author VH, boom. And you can see, again, all of this code is, is there for you to take a look at. It is all live. Um, the next one is inline style worker. So you, while we love using less files because they're hyper performant, using less and having something be authorable are sort of like just juxtapositions of each other. Um, it's very hard to generate less or generate CSS, um, a, an actual CSS file if your component is actually authored. So a lot of times what we'll do is we will essentially create a, a style tag next to the component. So this is good because it's very accessible. So, you, you know, right now Shadow DOM is very anti-accessibility and hopefully the HTML standard bodies will, will get that together. But um, so if we view as published and we just go ahead and inspect this, you will see that we have a style tag here. And so again, this uses what we call inline style workers. And again, a very pluggable system. So you can go check out our border uh, inline style worker, our background image style worker, our background video style worker, our gradient style um, inline style worker. And so these give you a pluggable way to create inline styles for your component. And it's extremely efficient. So if we go and we look, you can see that this t actually takes up, if you were to compare this to what you would see on adobe.com, this is actually a significant improvement with how we are generating this CSS. Um, the next one, uh, responsive properties. So again, going back to being multi-tenant and being um, and uh, really respecting different brands, you might have responsive properties. So Adobe.com, we typically have mobile, tablet, desktop. Um, but those properties might be different for you. You might say, well, I only care about mobile and I only care about desktop. Well, we created a service. So as you see, you know, if you look here, we have um, these media queries, and these are actually generated based off of the responsive properties. So if we go here and we go to responsive configuration, JCR content breakpoints. So you'll see that we have mobile, tablet, desktop. And if we go to mobile, we can see where it starts, it starts at zero, where does it end, 599. And so we can bubble these out to the UI. Um, and again, this is context aware, so it's multi-tenant friendly, and you can configure these. You don't have to like constantly hard code all this, all these, uh, responsive properties over and over and over again. It's just a service that you can plug into. How am I doing on time? I'm getting short. Um, I'm going to skip lock property, but essentially it's a render condition at the component level where if you choose to lock a particular property, so we have very complex components on adobe.com, but the way we get around that complexity at the page level is to essentially bind and turn off parts of dialogues. So authors only have to see like, oh, create background image. That's all I need to worry about. I don't need to worry about, you know, let's say uh, flex justification. Um, and then par light is essentially, it's very similar to the existing parsis in libs, except for it has had a lot of um, memory analysis done uh, to rip out some of the things that you don't need, but it's still editable template friendly and it still, works with the style system. So all of that is still baked in. You can see that we're actually using a lot of the out of the box stuff. It's just, uh, I think a lot of the legacy like five, six features have been pulled out. Um, author watch. So if you've ever used refresh page because you need to execute JavaScript, um, this is your answer to immediately uh, support components. So a lot of times you'll put something on a page and you want to re-execute the JavaScript that's at the foot of, footer of your page. So you might use refresh page, and then if you have a big page, you're waiting around. So AuthorWatch allows you to put anything. So we'll actually use the Marketo component as an example. So we'll just go ahead and put in the Marketo component. And then what you'll see is we'll just select one of my forms. So we'll just select Chris form, and boom. You can see that that JavaScript got executed. And so how do we do that? And again, this is a pluggable service that you can use. So if we look at author watch, so the way it essentially works 
is that you register any functions that you want. And so we could actually go in and see another use case of register function. We'll actually go look for the Marketo one. I believe it's in Marketo. So here we have, so if we have DX, go ahead and register initializing a single Marketo component. So of course this doesn't run on a published instance. So again, we're having really good separation of concerns. And I think that's it. Um, and I will try to quickly talk about a roadmap. So basically uh, we're in October, we're gonna be shipping Flex Container. You saw parts of it here. Um, it uses essentially all those features I just talked about. Um, November, UI test automation that will be running natively on EMS Cloud Service. December, we have a we have a, a something called dynamic experience fragments. It allows self-service personalization. Um, just a real quick follow-up. Our repo is at GitHub, Adobe, forward slash Adobe DX. Please file issues if you have them. Please join the discussion. If you want to check out Sonar Cube, it's available at sonarcloud.io. There's also a link. Um, you can actually see that right here. And so we really do mean what we say in that we really want this to be a quality-driven, pluggable, and primitive um, project. And with that, let's have some questions. <laughs> so the main use case for DX is all of those features. If any of those features sound interesting to you, then you would use DX and you would use it and you would pull it into like, a, let's say an archetype project similar to core components. If you look at our docs, you, our docs project that's inside our repo, you'll, you'll see how you can import that. But you know, there's, all of those features and more. Um, and so if any of those sound interesting to you, um, then that's why you would use it. If you saw no value in the last you know, 30 minutes, then I guess you don't need it. Yes, that's actually a really good question. Um, one of the key tenants of DX is that we didn't want to be an all or nothing. Um, so if you, if you only want some of the admin utils, you only have to bring in the admin project. If you want structure, structure does have some dependencies on admin. If you only want the Marketo component, you only have to bring in the content. So the, the project is structured in a way to do admin, which only runs on author. It's intended to only run on author. Structure, uh, content, and there's some core bundles that um, are also associated with some of the things I talked about. Yeah, if I can add to what Chris said, uh, we could have gone at a finer grain for for components, but it would have been too many artifacts. So we decided to uh, keep the, the, the grain to be the component group. And then, yeah, 2021 is when the beers happen in Berlin next year. I hope so. <laughs> Maintained by Adobe. Uh, but adobe.com to be very specific, not the <laughs> EM product team. Although if, if they have contributions, community contributions, of course, they're more than welcome. But yes, Adobe, Adobe employees, Nicola, myself, and several others, as well as the community. Yes, the, I, I guess, yes, we, we are directly reachable. Uh, uh, and uh, we, yeah, for, <laughs> but uh, as soon as we release, um, I, I, we, we still have to clarify exactly uh, what are we using on production and so on. We haven't, uh, we are using some of it already, um, but we need to some documentation on uh, what is used and uh, has gone through all our tests. I, I guess also we need to say that uh, we can't uh, support all of, of, of our versions of the time, but uh, yeah, this will come afterward. We should okay. stop, right? <laughs> yeah, I think we're done. It says we are over to you. So. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Bye.